Arthur Zients was born in 1949, into a family where two very different cultures merged. His father came from a largely illiterate, Polish immigrant family. While his mother came from a world of southern elegance. But, there was one thing they had in common, which was the belief in the religion of Catholicism. After his childhood, he abandoned the idea of religion and sought meaning in science. From here, Arthur began his higher education career by attending the University of Michigan. He was determined to get his degree in engineering physics. He succeeded and received his bachelor's degree in 1971. He chose to further his education at grad school, still remaining at the University of Michigan. Finally, he received his master's and PhD in physics. Zients went on to be extremely successful in his professional life, receiving titles such as Visiting Associate Professor at Laboratoire de Spectroscope in London, Paris, Visiting Research Physicist at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Munich, Germany, Visiting Scientist at the Institute for Quantum Optics in Hanover, Germany, Visiting Professor for the Department of Physics at the University of Rochester, Fulbright Professor at the University of Innsbruck, Austria, the Director for the Academic Program of the Center for Contemplative Mind in Society, Director of the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education, Co-Founder of the Kira Institute, Past President of Lindisfarne Association, and finally, Co-Founder of the Fetzer Institute. Well, Zions actually came extremely close to dropping out of college, a thought we've probably all had. More than once. But, author had a discussion with his physics professor about why he wasn't satisfied with his performance. Through a combination of readings, experimenting with techniques, and connecting with different professors, he was finally introduced to a whole new way of learning. He was able to broaden his concept of learning and eventually all of the classes he had been taking began to make sense. In an interview done in 2011, Zients had a lot to say about this experience in college, claiming that he had to situate this striving after a physical understanding of the world. He claimed that it was no longer just an isolated bit, but something integrated into all of our human concerns. In other words, in order for education to be useful and successful, we have to be able to connect the things we are studying or being taught to the rest of our lives. And that is an essential part to liberal education, broadening, understanding, and making connections. This is why his voice is important. He's been in the position that so many of us are placed in daily, struggling to understand the point of it all, and he successfully broke through the barriers and came out on top. With that being said, author realized the importance of the education system, it needed to provide a variety of learning techniques, and he acknowledged that in order for information to really sink in, students would have to be willing to have an open mind. As a result, came Arthur's practices for contemplative pedagogy, or mindfulness in the classroom. The first practice is mindfulness itself, which we practice almost daily in this class. Mindfulness involves concentration, usually on breath, for a certain amount of time. The goal is to be undistracted, but if the mind does end up wandering, one simply refocuses. A second technique is concentration. We've practiced concentration before using paper clips. The main goal of concentration is to focus on all aspects of an object, so that all powers of thought and awareness are directed towards one single object. Another practice is called open awareness, which involves either releasing or receiving information. Zients uses the example of a bell ringing. When practicing releasing information, students are asked to let go of the bell sounds and any memory of it that they may have. Now, they are open to undirected awareness. On the other hand, when practicing receiving information, students remain receptive, without any expectations. This allows students to acknowledge any thoughts or feelings that resonate with the sound of a bell, in their space of awareness. The last practice is one that Arthur calls sustaining contradictions. 
to exercise sustaining contradictions one must maintain and intensify an event where two opposites can be true at the same time. Arthur suggests picturing a blue circle, and a yellow circle, opposite of each other on the color wheel, and then slowly changing the size of each circle simultaneously. By doing so, one is resisting the automatic reaction to resolve the contradiction by instead intensifying it. In conclusion, Zionist practices add to the idea of transformative education. Mindfulness in the classroom aims to target voluntary attention in academics by strengthening the attention capacity in students. In the words of science, contemplative pedagogy deepens experience through repeated engagement, which leads students to gradually foster those capacities for insight. This will eventually aid them in the true understanding of their studies and even assist in the moments of discovery. All in all, Author Science's findings greatly influence the ideas and goals of liberal education by providing techniques that can be used to exercise the mind, resulting in a greater level of understanding. The summary of our, of our work together. Yeah, it seems to me that we have these, these three domains, you could say. It's the... Uh, it's the practice which allows us to presence that future, which Otto Scharmer speaks about. And I think that one way of strengthening that is through a contemplative method of the sort that we actually did together. But then doing it alone is insufficient. That is to say, we need to also come into relationships. Relationships not only of dyads of two people, for example, through conversation, but in a circle, such as the circle that we actually created over these last weeks, but in particular my participation today. So that's a second dimension, the set of relationships. And then, and then finally the third is the, the way of enacting, of bringing this into, into life. And there there's a, a number of themes that we came up on today which I thought were quite beautiful. You know, the, the themes of, of, of faithfulness to each other, of a circle of trust, a place where there is no fear, a place where we can inspire one another inspire one another in ways that we then take back with us into life so that the circles that we have in other parts of our lives than this gathering are also infused with and infected by that kind of uh, inspiration so that the presencing that takes place in us in our own reflective and contemplative uh, moments is shared through a certain set of relationships and then that propagates out still further through our, through our various relations. And that this seems to me to be the way in which really large-scale transformations take place. They don't take place through a kind of central planning process. They take place through being awake, you know. And that wakefulness allows us to first of all see and experience the real needs of this world and connect them to our lives. And it also allows us to be awake to each other so that when we meet, we meet at a deep level and can share those sets of concerns and discover our partners in ways that are absolutely essential for the future. You know, we need those partners, we can't do it alone. We need also those ideas which are going to be seminal for the transformations that we want to affect. And so rather than seeing this enterprise as some kind of directed from a central organ out into the world, it's really a way of developing a, a kind of inner capacity which translates into relationships and then translates into a broad-based reframing and regeneration. Uh, as you talk about it here. It's, it's exciting to be part of that conversation, even if only for, for this morning. Talking, talking about awakeness, What's, what was your first awakening? My first awakening? Well, I'd say my first awakening in this respect, you know, took place when I was a college student. And it takes place, I think it often takes place at the hand of suffering. I think if you're kind of insulated and content, you know, then your awakening doesn't take place. It's like when the, the young Siddhartha steps outside his pleasure palace and he sees suffering and death and so forth, then something happens. And in my own life, it was at the hand of a, a college crisis, you know, a crisis in my college years, and a sense of uh, existential loss in a certain way, or meaninglessness. And it was only out of that then I began to seek and search and found a teacher, 
and a professor that I had who had sides to his person I did no idea about and began to explore these contemplative pathways and then merge them with my science. How is it that the science of the natural world and